To have a breakthrough mindset, to have an overflow mindset, but we also have to believe that the best is yet to come. They marveled that the best wine was saved for last. Usually you bring out the good stuff first and the cheap stuff later when everyone gets a little shicker, too drunk to tell the difference. A breakthrough mindset always believes that there is something better to come. We gotta have a breakthrough mindset for America. We gotta have to believe that the best days are not behind us. We gotta contend for that until our last breath. Of all the miracles he could have performed, why is the first miracle the water into wine? Has to be a reason. Well, think about it for a moment. What's the first miracle Moses did? Moses turned the water into blood, but Jesus turns the water into wine. Why? Because he doesn't come to bring death. He came to bring life that we might have it more abundantly. And what's the symbol of the messianic kingdom throughout the Bible? It's the wine. Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. To him will be the obedience of the nation. They will tie their donkeys to the choicest grapevine. They'll wash their garments in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be dull from wine. So we see wine. The mountains will drip with sweet wine. Amos 9, a 12. There's so many verses that talk about, or 9, 13, so many verses that talk about the new wine in the kingdom. What he was doing by turning the water into wine is that he was giving a sneak preview of the coming messianic attraction, and he was restoring, as we'll see in a moment, what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And so that raises another question, another detail. He does the miracle with how many stone pots? Six stone pots. Why not seven stone pots, the number of completion? Why not eight stone pots, the number of new beginnings and transcendence rising above? Why six stone pots? Think about it for a moment. What day was man and woman created? They were created on the sixth day. In Jewish thought, we fell on the sixth day. And as a result of that, according to rabbis, we lost six things. So when Jesus comes and does the water into wine with six stone pots, he's restoring the original fruitfulness and blessing of creation. It is a sneak preview of what is coming in the Messianic age. The rabbis say in the Messianic kingdom, we will drink wine that's been reserved for us from the six days of creation. It's going to be some good wine, right? But there's something more. When he dies, the day that we celebrated is called what on the Christian calendar? Good Friday. Friday on the biblical calendar is the sixth day of the week. So think about it for a moment. The six stone pots connect to the day he died, Friday, which is the sixth day. Because in the very beginning, man and woman took from the tree. They couldn't correct what they had done. So what does God do? God puts back on the tree, puts back on the cross for you and me what the first man and woman couldn't replace, God replaces with his son. Think about it for a moment. Why are his hands pierced? Because our hands stole from the tree. Why is his side pierced? Because Eve, the one who led Adam into temptation, was taken from the side. He's making an atonement for Adam and Eve. His feet are pierced because the first messianic prophecy is the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Satan's the original OG. He's the original gangster. He's like, you think you're going to crush my head? I'm going to nail your feet to a tree and let's see how you're going to accomplish it now. He thought he was foiling the plan of God. He was actually fulfilling it. And what does Jesus have on his head? A crown of, why a crown of thorns? What's the curse of creation? The ground will produce what? Thorns and thistles. He's literally taking the curse of creation on his head to break the curse and to restore the blessing. And we said letters and numbers are interchangeable. The letter six in Hebrew 
is represented by the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is the letter Vav. The letter Vav is the most used letter for sure in the first five books of the Bible. Almost every verse from Genesis to Deuteronomy begins with the letter Vav. And it is the conjunction and in Hebrew. It can be used as the conjunction and when it's placed in front of a word. And so the first place the letter Vav occurs is, guess where? Genesis 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1 has seven words in it corresponding to the seven days of creation. The sixth word of Genesis 1, 1 begins with the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Vav, and God created the heavens. The sixth word is and, and then you have earth. So Vav is a letter that connects what? Heaven and earth. When we sinned, we broke the Vav. We broke the connection between heaven and earth. Jesus dies on the sixth day to restore that connection. The Vav is actually in the shape of a nail because it symbolizes the nails by which Jesus was put on that tree for you and me on the sixth day to reconnect heaven and earth. And think about it for a moment. When he dies on the cross, think about the symbolism of the cross. One bar represents the horizontal, the vertical, heaven. One represents earth. One represents love the Lord your God. One represents love your neighbor as yourself. And he dies at the intersection of heaven and earth, of physical and material, and of the love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself to demonstrate what that is for us. The great commandments on the cross are being demonstrated to us. He's on the cross for six hours. There's darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. He's pierced in six places, his head with the crown of thorns, his two hands, his two feet, and his side. I mean, man, it even connects to the mark of the beast, 666. See, six is the conjunction and, but six is also the number that represents the physical world. God created the physical world in six days, okay? Reality is based on the number six, height, depth, and width. Each have two aspects to each one of them. We won't go into the depth of all that. Okay, but six represents biblically the physical world. One of the things it represents is the number of man. That's why the mark of the beast is 666, because think about it for a moment. Anything you say three times in Hebrew is the most, okay? That's why the angels cry out, as we sang this morning, which I love, holy, holy, holy. The reason why they say it three times is three. When you say it three times, it means the maximum in Hebrew as an expression, okay? It's the ultimate superlative. So 666, three times, is all physicality disconnected from spirituality. That's why it's called the mark of the beast, because you're nothing more than an animal if all you do is focus on your physical needs and you forget that you also, first and foremost, a spiritual being and have a soul. What if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? It's part of the reason why heaven is paved the streets with what? Is that because God is the ultimate hip hop dude? Like he's icing out heaven. He's got the bling bling going on. He's got the pearly gaze. He's got the gold streets because he's got it like that. He's showing off. He's got the drip. He's the man, right? No. Yes and no. He does got it like that. But no, that's not the point. Here's the point. What people will rob, kill, destroy, and sell their souls for is only pavement in heaven. It is a reversal of the values of this world. We're coming to Passover. The Egyptians try to take the gold with them. Look at Tutankhamun's tomb. But guess what? It didn't go anywhere. You can't take it with you. And so 
We have to understand that we are spiritual beings first and foremost. And this leads us to the practical application. What does God want to do? What does breakthrough look like? Number one is this. God took something ordinary like water and transformed it into wine. It's my New York accent. Water, water, water. Okay. You turn on your faucet, water, water comes out. A good bottle of wine is worth so much money, right? He takes something ordinary and transforms it into something extraordinary. And guess what? When you give your life to Jesus and let him work in your life, he transforms you from ordinary to extraordinary. Say, I'm not ordinary. I'm extraordinary. Turn to someone and say, you're going from ordinary to extraordinary. In Messiah, we're a new creation. The old is passing away and the new is coming. Now, let me just say this. We're going to run a few minutes over. Hang in there. Listen. Listen. To go, you know, one of the, you know one of the number one things that keep people from going from ordinary to extraordinary? Say this with me. Imitation leads to limitation. When I was young, I wanted to be like Mike, Mike Jordan, Michael Jordan. So I'd hang out my tongue and try to dunk. I had to lower the hoop first. I'm not Pastor John here, okay? Don't have that height advantage. Listen, if you try and be like somebody else, you can never be who you are. Stop trying to be somebody else. Be you. You're an original. Don't be somebody else. Number two, we have to live out of an abundant, and we have to live out of an abundant life mindset. Think about it for a moment. God does the miracle only when everything runs out. God often lets everything run out. Why? Because you have to come to an end of yourself before God can really begin with you. But so many of us can't move past that reality. We see the lack. We see, the, we see what we don't have. And God wants us to know that there is more than enough with him. He doesn't say fill the pots a quarter, fill the pots halfway. He says fill the pots to the brim, symbolizing the fact that God likes to bless abundantly. Trust him for the overflow. Be generous. We have to learn to see the good. There's two eyes in the Bible. Jesus says there is a good eye and a bad eye. Listen, the bad eye only sees the negative. It sees the pessimist, it's the pessimistic eye. It sees everything that's wrong. It sees the glass as half full. The good eye sees the promise, the potential, the life, the blessing in every person and in every situation. Jesus was the greatest leader to ever live. Why? Because he saw things in people that they couldn't see in themselves. He didn't see the garbage, he saw the gold. And he built people up. See the good, train your eyes, stop looking at everything that's wrong with you and others in the world and the situation and it's going to hell in a handbasket. Listen, God is bigger than all that. Number four. I would never, so think about it for a moment. The word for wine in Hebrew is yain. Can you say yain? Equals 70. The word for I, ayin, equals 70. The word for hidden, sowed, equals 70 in Hebrew. What's the connection? Connection, wine, I, hidden. Listen, I'm not so smart that I could walk by a grapevine and think if I take that grape, pull it off the vine, crush it with my foot, put it in a bottle, leave it on a shelf, and let it sit for a few years, it's going to create something that's way better than the grapes and way more valuable. What does this tell us? Grapes have an inner essence, an inner potential. But the eye has to see past what's on the surface, 70. What's hidden, 70. 
and that grape has to be crushed and pressed to bring forth the juice. The point is this. There's more in you that's on the surface. But it takes the pressing to bring forth the blessing. It takes the pressing to bring forth the promise and the potential that is in you. And some of you are like, I don't want to be pressed anymore. Listen, he wants to bring out every last drop that is in you. Not only do you have to be pressed, you got to be shelved. The wine has to be put on the shelf. How many of y'all feel like you've ever been shelved? It's part of the process. The better the wine, the greater it has to sit. God is preparing you for something. And just in the side, the best wines, the most robust wines, grow in their most inhospitable rocky soil where they have to fight for their nutrients. It which gives them the robustness. Some of y'all need to embrace the struggle. It won't be forever. To have a breakthrough mindset, to have an overflow mindset, we, have to, we also have to believe that the best is yet to come. They marveled that the best wine was saved for last. Usually you bring out the good stuff first and the cheap stuff later when everyone gets a little shicker, too drunk to tell the difference. <laughs> Friends, a breakthrough mindset always believes that there is something better to come. We got to have a breakthrough mindset for America. We got to have to believe that the best days are not behind us. We got to contend for that until our last breath. Yitzhak Perlman was a famous violinist, a great classical violinist. He was playing a concert. In the midst of the concert, one of the strings broke. And he continued, and everybody thought he was going to have to stop. But he remodulated and retuned on the fly and continued to play the entire concert on three strings. Afterwards, he got a standing ovation. How could you do that? It's unheard of. Someone asked him, and he responded this. He goes, I'm a professional musician, and my responsibility is to make music with what remains. Friends, if you've ever seen him, you understand that he contracted polio as a child. He walked on the stage with leg braces and crutches, and he had to unbrace himself and take off all the apparatus to be able to play. So many people with that degree of disabilitating situation, limitation, would not think that they could become one of the world's greatest classical musicians ever. But he did. They understood that when he said, I make music with what remains, he was talking about the disease that he lived with his entire life. That's what gave him the ability to do what he did. Some of you might feel like, man, I'm only playing with three strings. I'm only playing with two strings. I'm only playing with one string. But guess what? With God, even one string is enough to make something beautiful of your life. Even one string is enough to bring forth something that impacts and changes the world when we give it to God because the promise in him is a life abundantly. The promise in him is a new creation. Your responsibility is to give him what remains, to give him what you got, and to trust that he's gonna bless it and do something amazing with it. Amen?